Well, first of all, I'd like to announce what we're going to do. We're going to have a conversation with the English author, the, sorry, I would say the British author, and I will explicitate that later, the British author, Mr. Robin Robertson, who's written a wonderful book called The Long Take, which has been translated into Dutch as Hier maak ik mijn stad, which actually refers to the very last line of this book. And um, maybe I should uh, add something about myself as well. I am a book reviewer and an interviewer for the Volkskrant, a national daily uh, newspaper. And I first uh, met Mr. Uh, Robinson a very long time ago when we were discussing Scottish literature. That was really a long time ago in the 1990s. And two years ago, I sort of um, uh, found him again when this book, The Long Take, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize, which is uh, the most, well, least influential literary prize of the British Isles and arguably, arguably of the whole world. Um, I would first like to, um, to welcome Mr. Robertson uh, tonight. I think you can hear me from London. Lovely to see you, Hans. Hello. Right. Great, very much. Very much, uh, well, uh, reciprocal feeling. I welcome you very much in this, uh, unfortunately, rather empty uh, theatre. Um, well, I'm sure we'll invite you back someday when there is an audience. Um, why, well, I'd like to ask you maybe to first read us the first page of this wonderful book of yours, and from then we'll go on. How about that? So this is, uh, this is the um, beginning of the book where um, young ex-soldier Walker um, comes upon for the first time, the city of Manhattan. And there it was, the swell and glitter of it like a standing wave, the fabled smoking ruin, the new towers rising through the blue, the ranked array of ivory and gold, the glint, the glamour of buried light as the world turned round it very slowly this autumn morning, all amazed. And it stayed there watching as they made toward it, the truck driver and the young man under pylons, wires, utility poles, past warehouses, container parks, deserted lots between the long oily marshes, the landfill sites and swamps before slipping down under the Hudson and coming up on the other side to find a black wetness of streets, trashed and empty, and the city gone. Thank you, Robin. You just said in the, in the sentence before you started reading that this is basically the encounter of the protagonist of the book, uh, a man called Walker, with the city of New York. Um, would you mind giving us a short idea of who this Walker is, a little bit about his past as far as relevant for the book that you have written? Uh, Walker is um, a young ex-soldier from Nova Scotia in Canada. Uh, he has served in the Normandy landings and in the subsequent campaigns across Europe, indeed into Holland. And he has seen and done terrible things. He returns to North America, but he can't go back to Canada and to his island life um, because of what he's seen and what he's done. Um, he feels broken and sullied and uh, he's trying to piece himself together, basically. So he decides to do what many ex-soldiers ex, uh, did at that time, was to go into the, the big cities and, and vanish um, and try and rebuild themselves. Um, so that's, that's the, the character. It, it was, he was useful to me because... Um, I was motivated 
to write something long about my experience um, moving from rural Scotland to down to London. And uh, so that, I suppose, was the beginning of the genesis of the book. Yeah, yes, I... I... I said uh, a famous English uh, English writer, and of course I, I corrected myself, saying British. I do apologize. I know that England and Scotland is not really the same. Um, so you traveled. You you grew up in 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 Scotland in the Aberdeen area where you studied, I think, and then mm. you went down south to London. Um, was that an experience which is also well, which also had its, shall I, maybe a big word, its traumatic elements. Yes, um, it was exciting too. Um, it's, a, it's a familiar journey for many Scots and many Irish as well. Um, and it was the, really was the seed for this book because um, I've I've written five individual collections of poetry and then a, a, a selected poems and they're all short lyrics. Um, but I I wanted to try something on a on a bigger canvas and. The prompt for the long take really was um, a desire to go back to that time and to re-examine the ambivalence I felt as a a 20-year-old arriving in London um, and the overwhelming sense of of terror and um, glamour and excitement and fear um yeah it was um, so that so so that was the beginning of the book really yeah yeah and then uh that's an experience which doesn't necessarily uh ask for uh the, the huge uh traumatic experiences that that walker has experienced what made you what made the connection to the second world war and the aftermath of that war uh as 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 a subject Well, um, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to set this book in London. I wanted to set it in another city. Um, And the time that I've been most interested in is the immediate post-war period in America. Uh, I'm not an historian, but the decade at the end of World War II um, feels absolutely pivotal. America was then a very young country that had uh, come out from behind its picket fence and entered the war. The American dream had faltered earlier in the Depression and then with Pearl Harbor, uh, America was forced to, to enter the war and it left its splendid isolation and its insular security and it became the most powerful nation in the world, um, economically very successful. Um, and it, it told everybody that it had won the Second World War. But at the same time, it seems to me, um, in 1946, uh, looking back at it retrospectively, this is when America started to fall apart because it was so... Um, traumatized and exposed at the end of the war, um, deeply paranoid about communism and the atomic threat and riddled with corruption and organized crime and uh, with these uh, already huge social and racial divisions, particularly in the cities. Um, So America was at that point only 170 years old but it was already falling apart, yeah. I, th- I think. And it's, it's so interesting you say this, but because uh, when I think of the post-war period of the United States, um, I always had the impression of America is now uh, has grown a superpower. Uh, unlike Europe, America is economically is thriving. We've got when the in the suburbs people buy their vacuum cleaners and their refrigerators and they buy their homes, they may have a car and happy days are here again and they elect a former war hero for president in 1952 and all is well. 
And so that's not at all, or maybe that's one, one side of, of a coin, but you've definitely focused on the flip side of that same coin. Yes, it's, it certainly looked terrific from the outside. Uh, the white picket fence was still white, but I suspect the wood was rotten underneath the paint. Um, and I think you can trace a narrative line from 1946 to the present day. You can see that in 60 years, America went through the HUAC committees, the, um, the uh, McCarthy witch hunts, the Cold War, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and now Trump. So it hasn't been a pretty, pretty story. No. But yet, uh, a very suitable and attractive one to you as an author of this book. Yes, yeah. And, and you're, you're partly right. Um, uh, America in the, in the late 40s was an extraordinary place. The jazz was the best in the world. Um, there was a sense of optimism, but um, it, was, it was crumbling um, but underneath it. And yeah. it allowed me, and I didn't know that much about, about that period, but when, when I, what I found out was very striking and interesting. And um, it allowed me to, um, to, to, to put Walker down uh, and he would just wander through the cities trying to find himself. And yeah. the cities that I chose were New York, uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco, because the other great thing um, artistically that was happening at that point was um, film noir. Uh, it was sub called that by the French, obviously, but but there were for about 10 to 15 years after the war, um, these extraordinary uh, movies were being made, um, which tell a very different story to the, the public American dream. Um, so that, so, and I've been watching Film, film noir since I was a kid in Scotland. I didn't know they were called film noir. Uh, I just, um, I found something, something about them chimed with me. That they were incredibly alien. I'd never been to a big city like that. But there was a mood, there was a tone that I, I found absolutely thrilling. And it was only when I moved down um, to London that I understood what these films were really about yeah. and it was existential dread yeah so um this um, this accumulation of interests um uh the jazz the film um i've been traveling in the states since i was uh, 18 um and did a degree in canada so it was a ter territory that i knew quite well and i wanted to explore it so i just started the book and and then two years later finished it and i think the uh, the genre or, or or method of filming of uh, film noir um also has some relevant associations with the second world war partly because uh, let's say some um emigre uh, emigre jewish uh, filmmakers uh, went to the United States and brought their maybe their anxiety and everything about the Nazi regime to um, uh, to, to the United States, but perhaps also um, after the war there was, let's say, the sort of a social atmosphere which um, demanded a different type of movies and the film noir genre very much fitted in with that attitude. Does that make any sense? Yes, um, it, it's certainly important to, to note that, that these films, although they are... They seem to us to be quintessentially an American art form, like the blues or, or jazz, but they were made, as you say, by uh, Jewish emigres fleeing the death machines of Nazi Germany. Um, and they were brought up with the aesthetics of uh, German expressionism. And they so they, they came with those skills, those techniques, but also with uh, their sensibilities and their terrors. And they imposed all of that on celluloid. And 
it, it made for um, very dramatic, um, very very dark, moody films that that feel t- sort of tangibly um, full of oppression and fear and also literally quite dark, weren't they? <laughs> they were very dark. They were made black very very cheaply, um, with no money at all. Um, often at night, and that's why they are so dark. And usually not in in uh, stages and uh, in studios, but uh, in out in in the real world, largely in Los Angeles, oh. in an area called Bunker Hill. Oh. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, your protagonist is called Walker. And, well, it's said he walks. That's his name and nature. And he is a, a war veteran, a war veteran of the Second World War. Um, another misunderstanding, in a sense. I've always thought that the, the war heroes of the Second World War were actually received as heroes, unlike those coming back from the Vietnam War. Uh, but that's no doubt my perception, because I was there when the veterans returned from Vietnam and I was aware of the reporting. And I wasn't there in 1945, obviously. So, um, uh, that's another sort of myth, actually, that you are sort of debunking in, in this book, aren't you? Yes, I think, I think uh, American servicemen, um, not just American servicemen, but specifically in this book they are, uh, came back to a very changed America. Um, uh, they, their traditional roles as, as husbands and, um, and wage earners and heads of the household, all that had been, uh, had been eroded, and indeed sometimes destroyed. Um, women were much more powerful in society and there are, you could argue that film noir is is a, a an exercise in white male panic that th- these men don't know what to do with their lives they they've been through hell and they've come back and their society has, has changed utterly um and so the femme fatale of of, um, of film noir is is the terrifying woman who is more powerful than the weak man yeah yeah now, this book has been um, designed in a rather special way. Uh, there are photographs in it. Uh, there is a, a map of Bunker Hill, the Bunker Hill area of uh, Los Angeles, down to Los Angeles, as it used to be. It's not there anymore in this way. You've actually had to do quite a bit of research in order to, uh, to, to, to make that map. And then in the topography of the book, there's also uh, an obvious distinction in various scenes. Do you care to tell us anything about, let's say, the structure of your book? Well, um, the structure sort of came came at the very end. I mean, I, I really was just making it up as I went along. But I, I, I wanted to bring in um, aspects of, of noir. And one of the, the most familiar tropes of the noir cycle is the use of flashbacks. So this was useful. So Walker leads the narrative, but he has a a series of increasingly disturbing flashbacks to the the war and also rather glorious ones to his um, flashbacks to his life in Nova Scotia and and the woman he left behind. And this positions him uh, as a, a kind of a figure in, a, in a, a dream and a nightmare. And the flashbacks to the war increase in regularity and, and strength towards the end of the book. And he's a, he's a typical um, veteran. He's, he's come back with a severe case of PTSD. Right. And, uh, and, a, and a bad drink problem. And they're all still out there on the streets of, of the West Coast of, of America, veterans of every war. Um, about 70% of the people who, who are living rough on the West Coast of the States are, are ex-servicemen. Right, yeah, yeah. 
Now, um, Walker is from Nova Scotia, as you said, in, in, the, in the east of, of, of Canada, which I think is a place that in the 18th century quite a few Scottish people fled to after the so-called uh, Highland Clearances, in which they were just driven off the country uh, for the benefit of the sheep uh, there, I think. Um, right. Is that also something for, uh, to, to, to make a personal connection uh, between you as an author and your protagonist, Walker? Yes, um, I was interested in his dilemma um, because it was my dilemma as well. Um, when I moved from Scotland down to London, I was um, I was moving within the same landmass and uh, speaking the same language, but I was regarded as an outsider and an alien, and that's precisely what what Walker feels like. So he's moving. He goes, he goes from Canada and off to war, but he, he can't go back to Canada. He goes to the States and he feels like a, an outsider there. And that, that whole business of being an outsider is something that I've been interested in yeah. most of my life. Do you feel an insider in, in London these days? Or do you still feel something? No, I, I've never felt like an insider. Right. I don't probably feel rather uncomfortable if I did. <laughs> right. So you like to keep it up, being a bit... Uh, My best. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, in your, your everyday London life, uh, you are uh, uh, an editor uh, at one of the uh, 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 most, uh, most famous uh, literary imprints, literary uh, publishing houses in, in London, Jonathan Cape. Um, people might think that, well, being... Uh, uh, a, 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 an editor of literary manuscripts in the daytime and being a poet maybe at night or in the weekends is a good combination. But I think you differ, don't you? No, it doesn't really work. Um, because if I'm, if I'm trying to read or edit um, somebody else's text, then I have to embed myself in it um, and to, to put it down at the end of the day and then turn to my own work is just impossible. So I've had to, I've had to um, write in intensive bursts, usually in writer's retreats, um, oh. go off for a month and try and do that. It's not ideal, but yeah, um, I've managed. It must have been an interesting experience two years ago uh, when you were uh, long-listed together with one of your own authors, uh, Michael Ondaatje, and ba basically in the second phase, uh, you made it to the shortlist and, and Ondaatje, who, who wrote a wonderful book, by the way, uh, didn't. must have been a very uh, odd experience. Uh, that was an awkward, um, an awkward phone call, yes. Um, but he was extremely generous and... Um, and are being about it. So. He'd already won the prize anyway. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, the title of the book is The Long Take. There are some references to that. Very much in the beginning, um, you write about Walker that he needed to recalibrate. He needed to take the long view. And later on, when Walker um, meets one of the, uh, the famous um, uh, uh, you know, people behind the film noir, uh, that's uh, Robert C. Odmac, uh, one of the great directors of, of that genre. And, and he says something like, ah, you've got what we call the deep focus, long eyes for seeing. And later on, there's a reference when he's talking to uh, another uh, film director, Joseph H. Lewis. Um, he's talking about this getaway scene, a very, uh, a, a very famous scene in the movie called Gun Crazy, which is taken in w as one shot. It's, it's complete three and a half minutes about a bank robbery, waiting for the, the robber to come back, and then uh, uh, escaping in the car. And uh, so there's, an, there's quite a few references to this long take. What, what actually does it mean to you? The long take uh, in in filmmaking is um, is a great test of of um, of a director's skill, elan, um, genius, um, and the 
film noir cycle is is peppered with extraordinary examples. The one you mentioned, Gun Crazy, the opening of um, Ride, Ride a Pink Horse, um, and the opening of Touch of Evil, breathtaking um, Orson Welles um, film. Um, it's the way I use it, I suppose I'm, I'm looking at, uh, at, at life being a long take. Right. Okay. And now the subtitle, it says, A Way to Lose More Slowly. Walker's yes. lost something, obviously. He lost a lot of things, actually. Mm. Uh, is that a reference to, let's say, the Second World War, and now you continue to lose, but in a, in a, in a lower tempo, lower speed? Yeah, it's a it's a quote from um, another noir film called Out of the Past. Right. Um, is there a way to lose? No, but there's a way to lose more slowly. Okay. Why did you find it a suitable subtitle for the book? Because I think Walker feels that. Um, the best he can find is a way to lose more slowly. Um, he's he he has decided he is a he is a a broken spirit. Right. When he meets uh, Robert Ziodnak in um, in a bar in New York, the film director suggests uh, for him to go west. I think he even gives him uh, his card. And, and Walker uses uh, the last money that he has, you know, the money that he saved to buy a ticket for the long train journey to the West. Um, and then he arrives in Los Angeles. And maybe you could uh, read us another bit from your book, uh, from page uh, 76, 77, when, um, w uh, when Walker has arrived in Los Angeles and how he experiences the city. Certainly. Um so this is Los Angeles at night. Um, Walker is looking for his friend, Billy, another um, ex-soldier. Um, he's, this is downtown Los Angeles on the streets of Skid Row among the homeless. Letting the night loosen around him, he wandered slow down sixth past Coles, past the Greyhound station, till he reached the east side, turning off down Maple, Winston, Pedro, Crocker. There was the sharp stink of disinfectant, ash barrels on fire. Throwing up flakes of light by which he could see them, rows of them, each face creased with age and heavy use, and beginning to rub, to open at the seams, like an old map. Their eyes closed again and there was that sweet smell of rot in the shifting shadows, a hand reaching for a bottle, the flare of a struck match disclosing one man's shoe split open like a pod, showing a line of blackened toes. In each dark corner, the whites of their eyes, every hand stretched out, the nickels and dimes he spilled into their open palms were soundless, thin as water in this heat, evaporating as he walked away. Men sitting round bottles, shifting in their rags, eyes watching the lights of planes drift overhead. Men lined up with their kit, sprawled out on the sidewalk in rows, wearing too many clothes, wearing all their clothes, trying to get some shut-eye before it all starts over, trying all they could. No sign of Billy anywhere. Only a prowl car slewed into the corner of Fourth and Los Angeles, revolving lights like some carousel and two cops running, yelling, stop police, at this guy who's already through third and halfway down the block to St. Viviana's. He pulls up, steps away from the dark, spreading his hands, taking the shape of a standing star. He might have been shouting 
but he was too far off to make any sense. And suddenly he reaches for his top pocket and seems to pull out a red handkerchief, steps backward, faltering, then rips another one right out of his face. It was only then that Walker heard them, the sound of the shots. Yeah, so much for a red handkerchief, yeah. There have been, um, there are two questions from the audience, one of which I think you've already answered about the advantage of being both an editor and an author, um, which are, uh, well, the short answer would be that there are actually none, I understand. Um, a second question is um, about uh, whether you are involved when your work is translated. Uh, uh, question, question of Saskia asked, I can imagine that your poetic words are hard to translate. Now, actually, I saw in this book there are some comments uh, about uh, a certain sentence which has been uh, divided into two uh, after consulting you. So there has been contact between you and the translator. Uh, how, how does this go, this process? Well, this is this is a lovely thing to, to happen to, to have books translated. Um, um, this is the first uh, time I've I've been translated into Dutch, and I had an excellent um, an excellent man Hans Kloos, who who sent me about five or six long emails with the most brilliant questions. He clearly completely understood the book, and I was. I've both excited and relieved, and I felt I was in very good hands. And in fact, he spotted a mistake that that no other editor had spotted. What was it? Um, I can't remember what it was. Now, <laughs> okay. but it, but it was um, you know, that's how close he was reading it. So I, I felt uh, privileged to be in his safe hands. Good. You already. Uh, mentioned the word McCarthyism, Red Scare. Maybe it's interesting to say a little bit more about it because I think it's also very relevant uh, for the movie scene. So also probably for quite a few of the authors uh, and directors that were involved with uh, with the film noir genre. Yes. Um, well, the, there was a kind of witch hunt, series of witch hunts um, uh, during the late 40s, um, which was mostly driven by um, Senator McCarthy, who uh, was finding reds under the bed um, mm. wherever he looked. And he wanted to, to purge any sense of communism or, um, or liberalism from, from America. And so he, he found ways of, of blacklisting some of the finest directors and actors um, in Hollywood, and and made the, and made many of them um, redundant, and they would they fled. I mean, including um, including Siod Mac, uh, he he had to leave the states, and he was one of one of the great directors. Uh, it was a very ugly time, and. Um, it was followed up with the HUAC committees, the House Un-American Activities. It's called HUAC. So these were just public tr show trials to, to denounce people as, as communist traitors. It's very interesting that in, in, um, in your book you also mentioned the, the, the figure of, of, of Roy Cohn, who used to be uh, a legal advisor of Joseph McCarthy's, and actually also a legal advisor, I understand, in the 1970s of Donald Trump. Yes. Which only goes to show. Uh, nothing, nothing it only goes changed. to show, yes. Um, and here we are, hoping to see the end of that uh, yes. vile moron. It might just be happen as we speak. Yeah. I hope so. Um, your, uh, your protagonist, uh, Walker, he is living with a, with a, a sort of a secret or at, or at least with, with, an, with an event in his mind, an event that has taken place during the war that actually sort of follows, in, follows him all the time uh, and, and he basically needs to, to confess it to somebody in order to really start his really start his life again because um, he's been 
well, he's been uh, haunted by it for, for years. The novel starts in 1946 and ends, I think, in 1957. So for 11 years, this, this haunts him. And then finally, he is able to confess what has happened to him and what he did himself uh, to uh, somebody who is in a position to understand. And then he feels that his slate has been cleaned and he throws away very significantly his knife. And then he starts, well, he, he, he makes sure, uh, he says, I can stop now, I can, I, can, I can make my city here. Can I understand that your book is eventually uh, a hopeful book, an optimistic book? I'm not sure you could accuse it of, of that. Um, it's, it allows the possibility for, for hope, um, shall we say. That's as far as I'm prepared to go. Right. Um, don't worry, I'm not planning a sequel. <laughs> You're not. Um, is it a political novel? Yes, I think it probably is. Um, because it, it, it tries to address some of the, um, some of the historical s social fractures in America that I think are now very, very evident now. And I was interested in pointing that out rather delicately, I hope, that, um, that everything that's wrong with America now and, and and why people are on the streets. Um, it started in 1946, and it was it was never corrected. And America is a country just driven by by money, and the people are just fall through the cracks, particularly the the damaged and the very poor, and and soldiers. Right. So um, yes, I suppose it is political in, in some sense but I wanted it to be a, about human beings under stress rather than examining a, a country breaking along its stress fractures yes it's it's amazing fascinating and 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 awe inspiring it's it's terrible to uh, to read the descriptions uh, especially by the character Billy Idaho which is a friend of your your protagonists uh, a black guy who's also been in the war and who tells about all the well let's say the urban destruction that's taking place in LA and I think it's it's such wonderful it, I don't think you quote the uh, quote the the, the the Joni Mitchell line but I think many of your reviewers did they paved paradise and put up a parking lot which is what's happening all the time. Now, I have one more question from uh, the audience, and that is about the future. You've just said you're not planning uh, as a, a, a second part of, of your book, actually, not a, not a, nothing to succeed the present book, but do you have any plans uh, for future books at all? Uh, well, one just came out about three weeks ago, um, which is hey. uh, called Grimoire which um, is a, an old word um, which means a manual for summoning demons. And it's, uh, it collects uh, about a dozen poems I've been writing over the past 15 years, uh, which find their source in Scottish myths and superstitions. And um, they're very unpleasant stories but uh, I enjoyed writing them immensely. Wonderful. Well, I'm sure we will enjoy reading them immensely. I would like to thank you very much from The Hague to London for being here with us. I hope in the future we can, uh, can welcome you uh, in person, physically. But for, for the moment, I'd like to thank you very much for an interesting conversation. Thank you. And thank you, Hans. A pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you.